Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Xu Chi, and I'm the director of the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Booksmith in Boston, Massachusetts. The Transnational Literature Series focuses both on themes of migration and displacement, as well as featuring works in translation. Our bookstore, Brookline Booksmith, is currently closed to the public, but we're thrilled to be able to continue on in a virtual format and welcome so many new people to the series. For this event, we are collaborating with one of my favorite independent bookstores, Point Reyes Books in Point Reyes, California, just north of San Francisco. Like us, their physical location is also closed, but you can purchase books from them through their website, and you can also see um, a list of their upcoming virtual events. Before we begin, uh, just a few crowdcast tips. On the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a chat window, which I know many of you have already found. Um, feel free to chat with the other audience members throughout the event. Um, along the bottom, you'll see an ask a question feature, which you can use throughout the event as well. Enter a question or vote for a question that you'd like answered, and we'll get to as many questions as we can toward the end of the hour. And finally, uh, you can see us, but we can't see you. So relax and enjoy the conversation. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Fernanda Melchor. Fernanda Melchor, born in Veracruz, Mexico, is widely considered as one of the most exciting new voices of Mexican literature. She's the author of three books in Spanish, and she's received a number of awards for her fiction and journalism, including the Penn Mexico Award for Literary and Journalistic Excellence. Fernanda is joining us from Puebla, Mexico. She's here tonight to share the first of her books to be translated into English, Hurricane Season, which was published earlier this year by New Directions. Translated from the Spanish by Sophie Hughes, the novel's furious vibrating language delves into the minds of four characters connected to the murder of a witch in their Mexican village. A deep exploration of the circumstances and stories that accommodate violence the novel is an extraordinary act of empathy, a work of art, and a breathless, unforgettable read. Hurricane Season received the 2019 German Anna Siegers Prize and the International Literature Award, and the English translation is shortlisted for the 2020 International Book Prize. Joining Fernanda in conversation tonight is writer and Boston Globe Books columnist Nina McLaughlin. Nina is the author of the memoir Hammerhead, The Making of a Carpenter, a collection of short fiction, Wake Siren, Ovid Resung, and most recently, the nonfiction book, Summer Solstice, an essay. She's joining us from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And now, Ananda and Nina. Hi, I think it's um, my turn. I'll, I'll want to read a, a little excerpt from a Hurricane Season. And just to put you into context, uh, well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read a part uh, of the middle of the of the novel, which I think it's um, like the heart of the novel because it, it's a, a small uh, like fairy tale that uh, the character Norma reads, and it's kind of like a mirror of the whole novel. And well, thank you all uh, from for being here. I'm really super nervous because I never read I never read in in, in English in public, so. Uh, it's such an honor to be here, and, and thank you so much uh, to Brookline uh, Booksmith for the invitation, and also to Point Reyes Bookstore, and Nina, uh, thank you, uh, and, and, and Shushi, of course. Uh, so, well, I'll shut up and start reading. <laughs> okay. Uh, one day, on her way home from school, Norma found a little paperback book with a ripped cover and fairy tales for children of all ages written across it. And on opening at random, the first thing she saw was a black and white illustration of a little hunchback crying terrified while a coven of witches with bad wings stabbed the hunch on his back. And the illustration was so strange that ignoring the time and the imminent rain, ignoring the dishes waiting to be washed and her siblings who needed feeding before their mother got home from the factory. Norma sat down at the bus stop to read the whole story because at home there was never time to read anything. And even if there were, she wouldn't be able to with her siblings racket, the blare of the TV and her mother constant yelling, not to mention peppers fooling around or the piles of homework that awaited her each night after washing the pots. 
which she herself had used at noon before leaving for school. And so she pulled the hood of her coat over her head and folded her legs under her skirt. And she read the whole story from start to finish, the tale of the two hunchbacks. That's what the fairy tale was called. And it was about a hunchback who lost his way one evening in the woods close to his home, dark and sinister woods where witches were said to meet to do their evil deeds. And that's why the little fella was so frightened to find himself lost there, unable to find his way home, wandering blindly as the night fell until suddenly he spied a fire in the distance and thinking it might be a campfire, he ran toward it, convinced that he's been saved. So imagine his surprise when he arrived at the clearing with the gigantic fire only to realize it was a witch's Sabbath, a coven of horrifying witches with bad wings and claws instead of hands, all dancing around the blazing fire in the most macabre fashion while they sang Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday three, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday three, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday three, and they were cackling their terrible witchy cackles and howling up at the full moon. And the hunchback, who still unseen, had taken cover behind an enormous rock not far from the fire, listened to that cyclic chant and uh, unable to explain how, unable to explain the overwhelming urge that came over him, took a deep breath as the witches sang their next Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday three, jumped jumped onto the rock and shouted at the top of his lung, Thursday and Friday and Saturday six. Well, I could go on because there are any actual paragraphs, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent, Fernanda, thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. And I wanna just remind everyone again, um, if you haven't already bought the book, this is just like one of the most thrilling books that I've read in a long time, masterfully translated by Sophie Hughes. There's a button at the bottom of your screen. Um, use it to buy this book. Um, Fernanda, you've started um, with with this fairy tale um, and the book opens with, with the killing um, of a witch. Uh, and one of the things that's so striking to me about the book is that it is so grounded in this specific time and place and yet there is this throughout this sort of otherworldly quality the sort of the sort of mode of fairy tale or the supernatural or even i mean even the sort of mythological you know this sort of out of time this timeless quality and i wonder if you could talk a little bit about um whether these two worlds you were very conscious of creating at the same time or whether the sort of otherworldly sort of naturally came as well? Um, I think it was, I don't really know for sure if one came first or the other. I just, you know, the, the subject itself, you know, like, like murder by witchcraft, uh, What's so weird for me, uh, 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 well, maybe you guys have heard this story, but but I was inspired to write this book, this fiction novel, uh, by reading a news story that I read uh, once, one day in the in the newspaper in, in Mexico. And they, they talked about the killing of a witch and uh, for, you know, like passionate, for murder for, for passion, you know, like that, that, that kind of... Um, of, uh, of motive and I just wanted to explore what 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 is behind what is behind witchcraft in the 21st century what what can we call witchcraft what are its uh, practices uh, what hides behind uh, concepts like witchcraft or, or uh, crime of passion or behind all these uh, discourses from the media about femicide, about violence against women or, or against transsexual people. So for me, it was very natural to try to conjure this kind of discourses all together. And I, as you know, the, also the story begins um, presenting 
like uh, the witch as one kind of a character. And then uh, after you uh, follow all the testimonies of the other characters, you get to know her uh, like more precisely or in another a whole different context. So I wanted to play with with all these. And, and as I was saying at, at the beginning, um, I think this this story kind of kind of um, uh, mirrors the the story because it's a you know it begins be, by being a story about a, a fairy tale witch, but then it becomes something else. The character just gets you know like more real, but at the same time surreal, uh, as you know as in this kind of a Mexican surrealistic quality that Andre Breton uh, was able to see, for example, uh, and the relationship with death and, and the relationship with uh, spiritual practices and this kind of a uh, mix that you can see really, really well in Veracruz, you know, that's a, that's a place that um, mixes uh, European Catholic views, but also indigenous uh, religion and, and African cultural elements also that got mixed together and and you know you kind of hear these stories uh, in the in the everyday in in Mexico and especially in in Veracruz. You you if you drive into Mexico City uh, in one of the main entrance by by car, you will see this huge announcement calling Brujo de Catemaco. You know, like Catemaco witchcraft. Catemaco is a place from Veracruz, and you know for a. If you really need a really powerful witch, you need to get a witch from Veracruz because <laughs> they're like the real good stuff. So I don't know, for me, it was impossible to to escape from all these stories, from all these elements. And and to for me, it was impossible to let, let them out to uh, uh, when, when I wanted to configure it, to, to um, set up this, this story, this particular story. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, talking about um, having the inspiration for this book be a news story, your background mm -hmm. is in journalism. You were trained as a journalist. And, and thinking about that, you know, I think there's, in telling, in telling a story journalistically, there is a safety in relying on the facts, you know, that you are telling a story based on facts, presumably. Whereas with writing a novel, you are, even if you're starting with facts, you're crawling into your imagination. <laughs> and that can be, I think, like a much more potentially frightening and surprising place to excavate from. And I, and I guess I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the differences and similarities of working in fiction and nonfiction and whether in sinking deep, deep into your imagination, if you were surprised by anything that you found there, sure, of course. I, I think uh, well, I was I was trained as a journalist. I I major well, it, it's different in Mexico. I did my licenciatura in journalism and my master degree in um, art and aesthetics philosophy. So it was kind of a whole different story. But in journalism, uh, at at first, you know, I wanted to. In Mexico, uh, it, it's beginning to, to change that, but when you want to be a writer, uh, normally you wouldn't think of uh, going to school for being a writer. Uh, we, we almost got no um, like writing, uh, creative writing uh, masters, or it, it's beginning to change that. But uh, the, the still, uh, there's still this romantic view that the writer should be born out of nothing, you know? Uh, and I, I wanted to, to have a profession that was close to writing, but not precisely studying literature because I didn't want it to be a critic. I loved literature, but I didn't want it to be a literature teacher, for, for example, I wanted to, to write. So I guess I choose journalism because, and I, I, I was also obsessed like um, uh, with uh, detectives, and, and uh, what I wanted to be when I was a teenager was an FBI agent because I was really impressed because of the uh, Silence of the Lamb uh, mm -hmm. movie. I wanted to be Clarissa Starling and, you know, Dana Scobley and from the X-Files. And I wanted to be a woman of action, you know, have a gun and uh, catch the bad guys. And, you know, uh, and also being like, you know, like a 
big brain, you know, and solve crimes. And and after a while, I decided that maybe it wasn't like going to happen because to be an FBI agent uh, and being Mexican doesn't go well. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it, it was going to be very hard. So no, I, I found that journalism was sort of um, a, a exhilarating profession also because it, uh, it took me to the streets. It took me to the people, you know, it, it get me close to people. It made me go out of my shell. It made me, you know, like became more uh, like proactive and, and, and gave me the right to ask questions, you know. And so for me, it was a very natural profession that I choose. But in fact, I never I never worked in, in media like a reporter. For example, I did some, I had some experience in editing, in an editing room, in a newspaper. And then I went to work uh, for the university, my alma mater. I, I, I worked in public relationships. And when I was uh, working as a, in public relationships, I start writing nonfiction. I start writing these small pieces. Uh, in Spanish, we call it crónica. It's a well, it's a long tradition of um, uh, writing uh, real events, but from with the tools of the literature. You know, like like what the new journalism was in in the sixties in the in the states. And I start writing about violence in Veracruz. Uh, so, for me, uh, first of all, journalism was a school of writing. So th there's lots of things that journalism teaches you when you write, for example, uh, that the reader is um, relentless, that uh, if you don't get to her attention, the, the reader, uh, she'll just turn the page and never give you another chance. And that kind of uh, 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 experience that uh, when you write literature, you think you that everyone will put up with your stuff, but uh, journalism journalism gives you like another way of reading your own stuff. And I also think that for me, it was a matter of building like literary muscle because first of all, I, I always wanted to be a, a novelist. Uh, novels were always like the, of all the genders, novels for me were like the, the, the most beloved, form of uh, reading and writing for me also always but it's so difficult to write a novel um, I, I mean to to become a novelist it, it also takes more time it it, it, it it's always uh, our biggest effort and and uh, normally writers we we start with short stories with with uh, poetry some some people and we will begin with shorter pieces because uh, to to be able to finish a novel it's it's something really really hard and for me I, I wanted to write a novel but I didn't have the technique I didn't have even the life experience still you know when I was in my twenties to to I mean there's like geniuses like Truman Capote who wrote you know other rooms other it's so it's otros otros Otras habitaciones, other rooms, other. Oh gosh, I don't know. I, 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 wait, wait, wait. Well, the, the Truman Capote's first novel. And um, for me, it was very hard. It was until I was in my 30s to when, when I, I felt like, you know, like capable of, uh, of accomplishing a, a, a feat as a, a novel. So, of course, I, I I could say that that it is very different to write uh, fiction from nonfiction, but in fact, I don't think there is there is so different. I think there is, of course, a safety net when you write uh, nonfiction. No, you can you have the facts, you have the testimonies, you have like the uh, like the um, field work, and you read a lot and you uh, research, you do your research, you go to the to the newspaper archives and everything, and and you have a picture in your head of this story, and when you find like the narrative thread that you want to 
to, to follow when you know how to tell that story, that particular story, it's so, you know, it, it's a huge pleasure, you know, it's like, you can feel like what a detective will feel when he's solving a crime, you know, it's like, yeah, I got it. And it's, it's really exciting and thrilling. And when, when, when you're writing fiction, there's, there isn't this safety net. It's like bungee jump, jumping, but with, uh, I don't know, like like in like bungee jumping in Mexico, you know. <laughs> you never know for sure what's going to happen, and you feel so exposed and naked all the time. And I think it's something you get used to, which with each with each book. But at the same time, it's always for me. It's always so uh, disturbing to you know finish uh, finishing up a draft. This this um, in this lockup, I. I um, I took the chance to write a new novel, a, a short novel, and at, at the at the end, when I print the the manuscript and saw it on the table, it's always so disappointing, you know, like like you rip your something apart from you, and then you watch it and you say, yeah, that, that's it, that's all, <laughs> really, you you can you cannot believe it, you know. And I, I, th th that doesn't happen to me when I wrote when I when I wrote Aquino's Miami. This is not Miami. My uh, short story essay, nonfiction uh, short piece book. That that kind of happened. Like you know, I, I it kind of wrote wrote it itself. Uh, and and with novels, you 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 are so overconscious at each step, and it's it's almost painful. But at the same time, it's. I don't know. It's 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 also super um, um, satisfying. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Um, in an interview with David Neyman, you talked. You used this phrase. Um, you talked about um, wanting writing to understand parts of yourself, mm -hmm. and you used this phrase, which I loved which was um, the experimental egos we call characters. And I love this idea. I think this is such a neat way to think about characters. And in the book, in Hurricane Season, um, you inhabit a few different perspectives, a few different characters, um, including some men and including some, I mean, some really kind of violent and misogynistic figures. And I wonder, what the experience was for you inhabiting these experimental egos? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I want to uh, say to, if David Neyman is hearing this, I want to excuse myself because when I did uh, that podcast, I was so nervous. It was the first time I ever spoke in English and I couldn't read. Uh, I was I was supposed to read the the same excerpt that I read today, but I couldn't. And I'm sorry, David. <laughs> I'll, I'll make it up to you. <laughs> and um, oh, oh well, um, yeah. I, I just about this this fiction. When when uh, I mean when you write when you write nonfiction, you you take reality and turn it into language, right? And when you do fiction, uh, when you do fiction, it, it's also the same. You you take some reality or layers of reality, or discourses that are uh, around reality or or into the realm of reality, and turn it into language also. And of course, uh, you need to, or or at least the the literature that I that I love that I that I like. Is the one that confronts the reader. That you know, that like, uh, it's the literature that uh, makes you feel something, it makes you feel things, strong and, and difficult things. That's the kind of books uh, that I love. And to, in order to do that, I had to inhabit like this um, other bodies, invented ones, uh, uh, through imagination and and through. I think it's it, you just grab uh, whatever it's in your mind, uh, all the things you've heard and and people that you know and people who you you've talked to and be friends with or been enemies with and try to 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 conjure a a, a mystery, no, 
Uh, I think it, what, what's more difficult about creating characters, it's it's not like um, invent, inventing detail, ma making up details to to make these characters, but to inhabit precisely what what they will be feeling in a certain time, and I, I just don't know so most of this book. Uh, writing, writing, it felt like, like, like a medium. I felt like a medium, like possessed by other characters, by possessed by other discourses, uh, by other, like you know, um, personalities that that were around me my whole life, and you know, the the, the machism, the misogyny of uh, hurricane season is the misogyny that I just grew up listening to. You know, all, all the things that the guys from the park say said were like what my friends, my boyfriends used to say when I was growing up. And and I think and things my dad used to say or my uncles or even like, you know, my aunts or, or all these all these um, uh, things that are, are not particularly nice but that for me it was growing up in a in a certain time in a in a certain place and i in this book i wanted to talk about uh these these things from the the perspective of uh from within the characters and for me it was important to do that with the language uh, which the characters will use because um there, there's this quote from Wittgenstein that used to say that the the the, the words that we use I'm I'm, I'm quoting uh, very liberally uh, the words we use are like the texture of the world we inhabit. So for me it was very important to use a very crude language because if I used a, a, a more elevated language to talk about these this, this harsh realities, for me, it was, it, it will be like putting myself, you know, from, from looking from looking up from, from the distance on, from above the, the characters. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, overall to confront the reader with these discourses, just as I was confronted with them when I was uh, growing up. And it, it's, it's, I, I, a lot of this stuff, I did it like intuitively, you yeah. know, like, like I just felt that way and I felt that that way was the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. There is that sense of it coming from not this kind of brainy intellectual way, but this, this way that is sort of from, from, from the gut. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, you know, there's this, this might be an impossible question. Um, <laughs> uh, so Octavio Paz in, in Labyrinth of Solitude or Labyrinth of Solitude says um, one of the most noble, uh, notable traits of a Me Mexican's character is his willingness to contemplate horror. And, and hurricane season is, I mean, there is a lot of horrific stuff that takes place. The violence is graphic, the violence, the, the desires are wide ranging um, and and messy and complicated. Um, and I guess I wonder, A, do you agree with Paz here? And, and if so, why, why do you think that is? And that's, I mean, that's a big sweeping <laughs> Well, I, I'm not sure if I uh, totally agree, but I will say that there is, uh, well, I can, I can feel in it me, uh, this desire to look, you know? And in, in Mexico, we have this particular gender of, uh, journalistic like really sensationalistic journalism it's called nota roja and it's like the criminal justice sec section but it's you know presented in a in a very like rich, like like really um horrific uh explicit way and it has a lot of readers in mexico you know or or it used to have it it used to have a lot of readers before the uh, big you know narco uh, organized crime explosion of violence before in the 90s for example it was a uh, nota roja la nota roja uh, and publications like uh, alarma were like uh, read a lot by millions of mexicans 
and they always used to put like these uh, really gory pictures of people having accidents or get or 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 that just had an accident or got killed or got murdered, you know, but really explicit. And for me, it was always uh, something fascinating in the the phenomena. For me, uh, uh, to understand why I wanted to look, and at the same time, I didn't want to look. And why everybody wanted to look, and at the same time not wanted to look. I, I even major in that, and in 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 art aesthetic. Uh, I choose a, a photographer who was a specialist in Nota Roja, who's called Enrique Metinides, who now it's considered, you know, contemporary another contemporary artist. Wow. But you know that took pictures like you know are are like horror tales or 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 noir films just in one uh, image. And for me, it was always fascinating to to contemplate that desire in me to see and to know and i think it's because i always been also fascinated with true crime and with nota roja and with real accounts of uh, murder and crime because as a child growing up for me i wanted to understand what it, what was happening in the world around me for example i remember being like eight years old or nine nine years old and asking my mom and reading in the paper and asking my mom, mom, what does rape means or what does incest mean? And my mom was like, okay, it's something that you don't need to know now. And and for me, the books were the and novels and and were the place where I found answers about that human nature uh, that I, I needed to know. For me, I think it was a matter of, of survival, yeah. you know, being young and listening to stories all around you and hearing how in Mexico life sometimes doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't, has no value, that life has no value, that a woman, that a woman can be killed and nothing happens and no justice is made. For me, it was something so impressive that I, I think, I guess one of my um, uh, uh, conclusion is that I want to understand. That's why I write about uh, violence, and that's why I'm obsessed with with violence. And I, I think it's, it's something very common. Most of the people I know that are that are that they are really, you know, like true crime buffs or or like uh, uh, serial killer, uh, you know, uh, fanfic of, are mm -hmm. are women, you know, because we as women uh, we need to know what what are what is the world we are facing. Yeah. And it, it's a little bit like the function of fairy tale for children. Fairy tales, you know, now we're, we try to like whitewash a little bit uh, children's fiction, but the, the crudest children's fiction was to familiarize the child with the dangers and the perils of the world. Mm -hmm. So I think it's kind of like that, or maybe I'm just, I'm just a morbid person and I'm trying to disguise all this with, uh, you know, sophisticated reasons. But uh, I think for me, that's 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 how it is. Yeah, no, that makes total sense to me, too. I, and I think I mean, it's interesting. You talked earlier using the phrase crime, crimes of passion and these sort of like talking about now these photographs, these sort of horrific photographs. And it's some in some ways like crimes of passion. God, like that makes me crazy because it's just like, oh, he couldn't help it. You know, yeah. like it almost isn't his fault, you know, and 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 it's almost like it's normalized in some way that like these these crimes this 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 like terrible violence is just like oh yeah this like this just happens you know and i wonder if there's i don't know if there's a way to like denormalize it you know and mm -hmm. i think i don't know in some ways to me like that sort of feels like gosh without like it the sort of thrust of the book in some ways feels that way you know um not intentionally but I don't know, sort of that, like, there's something, like, look at this in a different way, sort of feel to it. Yeah, the, the intention was, I, I was, uh, at first, I was really terrified because uh, my worst fear fear was to, the, the reader thought that uh, all these homophobic expressions were like mine, you know, like, like I was trying to glorify this kind of discourse when in fact I was trying to put it out like there on their uh, super bright light. I, I, that's what I wanted to do, you know? Um, and I, I, I don't know, it's just, I think 
the, the worst thing is when violence become normal like this. But you know, it's it's everywhere, and, and you you cannot even say that it's only in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in worldwide, it was first recognized. First, we recognize violence against animals, that violence against children. You know, it 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 became first ill illegal to to beat up a dog, then beat up your own child. So it's it's amazing, no? When you when you think of that, and and for me, it's a matter of always putting things like the most clearly that I can, even if that means to to expose things that normally are are not acceptable or not considered aesthetic or beautiful or literary or um, I don't know, like worthy, you know, of talking about. Yeah. Um, and so I'm gonna, this will be sort of my last question and then we'll open it up to the audience here. Um, you mentioned sort of being in lockdown right now and, and finishing up a novel. Um, I guess I'm curious to know what what you're sort of what you've been working on, um, what what is sort of coming next. Okay, uh, I'm like a super, um, how do you say? Like when you have so, a lot of superstitions, I have a lot of, well, yeah. I'm superstitious like hell. So <laughs> I'm, I think I can talk a little bit about the new book because it's now almost in its final form. And I feel like, you know, at ease with you. <laughs> and I, I can even tell that there's like 300 people looking at me right now. So, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, it, it's a really, um, I wanted to do something uh, even more intense than hurricane season, but shorter, you know? Uh, I think hurricane season is a little bit like, uh, you know, like uh, a little bit of season in hell, a little season in hell or a little trip through hell, well, to the inferno, you know, and, and this new book that's called Paradise, uh, um, it's like, uh, for me, it's like an arrow, no? It's something like really straight and to the point and super fast and super intense. And it has a lot to do about uh, obsession also, what we will call crime of passion, that's still a thing that's obs obs still obs obsessing me. What's behind what we call crime of passion? Mm -hmm. And uh, also this sort of um, scenery that I, you know, it's like the Gothic South of uh, Mexico. I, I've, I've always been fascinated with, uh, you know, like um, a little bit of uh, Capote, but mostly uh, Faulkner and Cormac McCarthy and this this part of the uh, Deep South that's also, you know, but the South in Mexico, the, the Gulf Coast, you mm -hmm. know, a little bit of, uh, uh, like, you know, like True Detective, also ambience, you yeah. know, that Galveston, uh, Gulf, Gulf of Mexico, and, and it's always, um, it's, it's also the scenery is it's, it's, it's put there. So I think I can talk about that. Yeah. Cool. cool. Exciting. <laughs> Exciting. I still don't have words to talk about that book. So, so it's, it's a little bit difficult to me, but, yeah. but yes, I, I wanted to share that with you guys. Cool. Thank you. Um, and now I think Shuchi is going to come back and field some questions hey. in the audience. Hi, <laughs> thanks so much for that great conversation, guys. Um, we have a bunch of questions here. Um, so let me just jump to the, some of the hurricane season specific questions. Um, so Matt um, asks, thank you for writing such an incredible book. One aspect I loved was how everything unfolds, how you will plant a seed of an idea presented as certainly a certainty only to come back to it later and entirely upend that certainty. Did you know how each section would play out before sitting down to write or did it unfold and go in new directions as you were writing? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, well, for me, that's how a novel should work. Like that's basically what a novel should do. Like, you know, plants all the time, this Easter eggs that will reveal uh, to be something exciting. Um, I, I spend my 
whole teenage years like reading like this kind of uh, page turners, like really crappy novels, but you know, like really exciting. And I love what novels can do. Like, you know, Stephen King's novel, like Anne Rises or, you know, whatever. But I, I love how you can read this stuff, you know, without even thinking, you know, it's just like going always so, so fast and so readable and always like with this, surprises and I, I, that's what I love about uh, novels in general. So I'm always trying to do that. And, but, but of course the story, well, it is very different how the story bo is born in your head and how it ends up being a book, right? So yes, I, I did like a whole map of uh, what are like the, the, the turning points and the, you know, like the, like the, like the interesting points and and like this succession of um you know of um of things that going going were going to happen and i i had it all mapped down but at first uh i don't know it, it was just a lot a whole bunch of writing so i think it's yes and no at the same time because i'm always normally when i start writing i always uh, have an idea to where, 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 where's, what's the final image of the novel, but not always I know how to, how to get there. So for me, it's always like uh, traveling by compass more than traveling with a map. And, and, and then when you have like the whole journey, then you map. Mm -hmm. Did any of the characters surprise you while you were writing? Yes, of course. I, I think that's when, when you, when you consider like the characters, like, like, experimental egos like you're always trying to 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 figure out what really defines them and not trying to impose what you really think of them but let them have this organic let them take these organic forms uh they always surprise you for me in this novel it was uh the character of brando brando at first it was only like a bystander like you know like a witness like somebody who tag along with, with Liz, Luis Mi and Munra just to see what happened. And uh, after I finished with, um, with the, the other characters, I, figure, I, I realized that he had grown in a, in a way that I couldn't predict it and, and became something really different. And, and it was really, really, I was really lucky because um, it, it, it is now like the, the, the most, I don't know. I think it's my favorite character. It's, it's like the most gruesome and difficult to handle, but that's why I have a particularly, um, like, I, I cherish him particularly. Okay, this question is from Alonzo. He says, what I like about hurricane season in the context of contemporary Mexican literature is that it manages to portray extreme and senseless violence without entirely falling in the frame of the recurrent and questionable narrative of the war against drug cartels. I wonder what Fernanda thinks about the position that Mexican literature should take in relation to the official discourse of the fight against organized crime and how Mexican literature should face the, the violence in reality. Well, yeah, th there's lots of people who made a career, a writing career by writing a uh, narco novel, no? narco novelas, like uh, uh, there's this, this special gender that uh, mixes up a little bit of our journalism with uh, real facts and 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 like detective novels or noir novels and and it's very popular in Mexico or, or was very popular until until lately and has a lot to do also with um, it, it has this particular regional flavor because it's al almost always um, like a fiction written from the north of Mexico and. I just, I, I never like identified with this kind of authors or, or this kind of stories because even when I was writing nonfiction about violence in Veracruz, I just was never really interested in, you know, like the version of the capos, you know, like the kimpings or, or the criminals, like the big ones, or never got really interested by the official version of the government. So for me, the interesting part was what the normal people was were living, you know, like like where the normal people were experimenting, you know, in the in the everyday. 
So what, how was this violence uh, being lived? And um, for me, talking about narcos is not necessarily uh, something that interests me, but more, more is, I, I would like to trace where did that begin? For example, I think if you read uh, Hurricane Season or, uh, well, if you, you can read Spanish, my first novel, Falsa Liebre, you can, you can find where all those sicarios came from, you know, uh, from these like particular places of, of this uh, youth with no future, of these uh, economic and, and, you know, uh, circumstances and the total, um, the, 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 the 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 people who the state has forgotten you know and for me it's more inter interesting to to trace these uh conditions and and to make them um like uh living like a scenery than to just you know talk about bad guys and good guys and two sides and and you know there's a whole lot of uh, literature and and you know uh series that talk about narcos and for me it's kind of um you know i don't even know if that's real a narco it's we we, we just got to the to a mythologization like it it it, it has like we 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 made them become like heroes and i i'm not even sure that that a narco would look like that no i, I don't know and also i think i was trying to talk about like real life in the south of Mexico, the southeast. That's a, a region that's not very represented a lot of uh, in, in, litera in Mexican literature. It's always the north of Mexico, or it's always Mexico City, you know, like in Bolaño. But, you know, the south is always like absent. So I wanted to, to talk about how things are lived, how, how people live this situation, like, you know, in, in a daily basis. And this actually ties into um, your answer just now, ties into one of um, this question we got from Anne Champion, um, who's talking about the style of the novel. Um, for those people who haven't read it, um, the novel has very long sentences and no paragraph breaks. And Anne says this makes the novel a relentless experience on the reader. Can you discuss what the experience was like for you to write it in that style? Or why you chose that style? Um, well, I, I, I think it was born out of necessity because um, it, it wasn't like I was like trying to be super smart and outsmart everybody and said, oh yeah, I bet I can write a novel without sentences. Uh, it, it was more, more like a technical fit. It was more a necessity of the intensity I wanted for the story. So I wanted a novel, you know, the, the, the theme was harsh. The story was super crude. So I needed a way to, 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 so the reader didn't abandon the book, you know, because it's so horrific sometimes that I needed like a, like a, a way for the reader to keep reading. And, and also a narrative voice that could combine like the inside and the outside, like, like a subjectivity from the characters, but also like this weird external point of view. And I don't know, I, sometimes uh, at first I call it the Pasusu uh, narrator, you know, Pasusu, like the, like the devil from the exorcist, mm -hmm. the demon from the exorcist, because I will imagine the narrative, the, the narrative voice, like a, like a demon that will go inside Chabela and start talking with her, you know, her mouth and her language and her brain and then going out and just traveling to the past, you know, and, and going back and forth. And, and I wanted, I wanted a reader, I wanted a, a narrator that could do that. And it was super hard to find it. And it, it, for me, it's just so tight, the form of the book with the narrative voice. It's impossible for me to, to separate them. Well, this is a question about the process of translation. Um, so how did you work with Sophie Hughes on the translation? How involved were you in the process? And if you were, did you have any interesting challenges? Well, Sophie Hughes is, is like a genius. Well, it's not like a genius. She's like, she, she's a genius, you know, and she's so meticulous in her work. And 
I, as a translator myself, I will say that, well, I, I've never worked with somebody so meticulous and and always trying to get to the right sense of a, of a, of a sentence. And it, it was a wonderful experience. And I learned a lot about my own language to trying to, to explain some things. But uh, there wasn't so much to explain because, in fact, uh, Sophie uh, speaks perfect Mexican. So she can understand very well uh, the... the the uh, lingo of uh, Mexican lingo. And there were parts where uh, I use like a lot of words and like expressions from Veracruz, from the Southeast of Mexico. And sometimes the, there we, 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 we needed to work together, but, but I'll send her uh, like, you know, videos and, and YouTube and, and about the songs they sing in the, in the novels and, it was a, it was a, an amazing experience and and really really uh, I I I was just telling you justly that um, I I now feel like uh, Sophie knows all my dark and deepest secrets because she has seen the stitches of the novel and there's uh, I don't know I think uh, I, I was really lucky to have a translator so invested in trying to justly translate. Not, not only the words, but the intention and the rhythm and the, mu the music, even the, the music that's, in, that's hidden beha behind the bad words and, and all the, you know, the horrible words that are in the novel. Thank you. I love hearing about the translation process. I think it's, it's so different with every author and translator and book. So thank you for that. Um, we have a lot of questions about your <laughs> tastes. Um, so yeah, who are the, this is from Mark Brumberg. He asks, who are the Latin American and Mexican writers you are reading? The young and the unknown ones that we should be on the lookout for as we search for the best new writing in the Americas. Uh, okay, well, uh, whoa, there's there's lot. I, I was thinking the other day uh, that, that I, I feel like a very American writer, uh, American in the sense of Pan-American, you know, like, because mostly of my most of my influences are American writers or Latin American writers, and besides a few sections of, of classicals of European, Spanish, or I don't know Lewis Carroll or, or some German or French writers, mostly of my readings when I was young that most impressed me, and as a writer I continue to search are American literature. So uh, I I. I um, I will say Latin American uh, of today. I, I love what Mariana Enriquez does. She's a kind of a horror writer, but not horror per se. I think she's a literary writer. I, I love what Samantha Schwebling does also. They're they're from Argentina. I love what Cab Gabriela Cabezón is doing also. Um, I love what Chilean Nona Fernandez. She she has this great mix of nonfiction and, you know, confronting the past and the past of our parents and uh, about the uh, Chilean dictatorship and, and, you know, like, but in a pop modern context, it, it's just, it, it's, it's amazing. She's amazing. And I think they are all translated. And in Mexico, I love what Antonio Ortuño and Emiliano Monge does, what Carlos Velázquez from the North and Luis Jorge Bonet also also do and i don't know from the past i will say i i'm i, I was i was a reader of gabriel garcia marquez that's i think when one think of a latin american writer maybe what first comes into mind is gabriel garcia marquez but of that generation i rather prefer jose donoso who was also translated a long a long time ago in, in english i i don't i don't I don't even know where, but I know he's been translated because he was a professor at Princeton and he had a close relationship to, to the States. And Jose Donoso is, is amazing. And also Manuel Puig, I love Manuel Puig's stories. And um, well, I, I we could just keep on talking about outdoors here and, and we'll <laughs> never be <laughs> over. Well, thank you, gosh, I think going to just be reading the rest of this quarantine. So <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Any final questions, Nina, before we sign that, off? That, gosh, I feel like that is that is <laughs> covered a lot of ground. 
Well, thank you so much, everyone out there. Um, please buy this book from Brookline Booksmith or from Point Reyes Books or your favorite independent bookstore. And good night from Boston. Thank you, Fernanda and Nina. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Sushi. Bye.